So we're going to be in Matthew 5 today, 21 through 48. Um, that is a long passage of Scripture. Um, and I'm not just going to I'm gonna not read it to you this morning. In your bulletin, if you picked one up, you'll see that it is there. And please read it at, when you can. It's, uh, it's a very long passage, but it's full. You know, It's got so much in it. Um, last week, John Wesley made an appearance and <laughs> spoke about the law and that Jesus came not to do away with the law, to fulfill it. And that from the Old Testament, the Jewish Torah and Pentateuch, the moral law remains in effect while the ceremony and civil law are not in effect for Christians today. They had a lot of arguing about this in the early church and then there's Council of Jerusalem. They worked it out and visions to Peter and Paul's uh, influence all brought us to the place that we find ourselves. It was Jesus himself who said all the law and the prophets hang upon two commandments. That we love the Lord our God with all our heart, with all our soul and all our mind and with all our strength and to love our neighbor as ourselves. And I, I think of the cross uh, when I think of this because it's exemplified. That vertical beam reminds me to love God whenever you see a cross. And the, and the horizontal beam is love your neighbor. Um, there's not a love yourself, but for some of us, and me included, it's important to recognize that I need to up the love of self. Because if I love my neighbor as I love myself and I'm hating myself, that's not what he's talking about. So that love also applies to those of us who wrestle with some negative thinking and, and, and put ourselves down. We need to understand we're children of God too. God loves us, wants all of us to love our neighbor as ourself and to love ourself in a way, not in an arrogant, self-centered way, but in a way that is righteous and, and full. Love who you are in God. You are created unique to be you, and God loves you in the place that you are. When we encounter him, he will move us to new places, but that love remains. And that message of love and grace is paramount to us because it's so easy to go the, for the path of the Pharisees. Most of us want to know what's right and what's wrong so that we have a, this is the to-do list, you know. And, and it's easy to get down the, the path of the Pharisees and we judge one another on our ability to follow the rules and regulations. And that's putting the emphasis not on love, on love and grace but on legalism and rigidism and regulation following and rule following. And Jesus came to show us a new way. It's a way of servant leadership. It's not self-proclamation. It's the path of humility over the path of elevating ourselves above others. And this path of self-sacrifice is the path of Christ, to love others and lift them up, to see those around us who, who might need a little help in hand today and to give that help in hand. Help them to become who it is that God created them to be as we live into who we were created to be. Jesus is very much interested, however, in how we live our lives. It's not that we are to do whatever in the world we want. There's boundaries and parameters for us, and that's given to us in Scripture. And the Sermon on the Mount in particular. But let me play you this snippet from Andy Stanley to illustrate a little bit about where I'm going this morning. Are you ready, Bob? <laughs> Sermon on the Mount is extreme. All of it's extreme. Anybody who says they love the Sermon on the Mount, they've never read the whole Sermon on the Mount, okay? This is the gouge out your eyes, cut off your hand, cut off your arm, you know, pray for your enemies. This is the stuff where people are going, oh, we, nobody does. Somebody wants one, give them two. They want your shirt, give them your coat. This is all this extreme stuff. The Sermon on the Mount is what your life would look like if you had perfect faith in God. That's what the Sermon on the Mount is. If you believe there is a kingdom beyond this kingdom, a value system beyond this value system, your life would look like the Sermon on the Mount. So as we mature as believers, we mature into more and more and more of that behavior. But Jesus just starts off on the extreme and said, okay, here is reality the way God sees it. Good luck. You know, I hope you get there someday. This is the value system from which I operate. And so within this framework, he makes his first statements about marriage, divorce, remarriage. So here's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna start with the verses right before these, and I'm gonna read straight through so that you hear this the way his followers heard this. Okay, you ready? We're gonna do this real quick. Here's what happened. You have heard it said, you have heard that it was said, you shall not commit adultery. But I tell you, at anyone who looks at a woman lustfully has already committed adultery with her in his heart. Okay, wait, I gotta say, if your right eye causes you to stumble, gouge it out and throw it away. 
Okay, I got, but it would be better for you to lose one part of your body than for, you to, for, than for your whole body to be thrown into hell. Okay, I have a question about hell. And if your right hand causes you to stumble, cut it off and throw it away. Okay, now you don't have an eye and a hand. It would be better for you to lose one part of your body than to, for you to go, for your whole body to go into hell. Okay, now we've talked about hell twice. I have a question about hell. It has been said. Anyone who divorces his wife must give her a certificate of divorce. That's right, because that's what Moses said. But I say, but I tell you, uh-oh. Okay, wait, 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 wait. Every time you say, but I tell you, the standard goes like way up. But I tell you that anyone who divorces his wife, except for sexual immorality, causes her to become an adulteress. What? And anyone who marries the divorced woman commits Adultery, wait, 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 the person that marries, again, you have heard it said to the people long ago, do not break your oath, but fulfill to the Lord the vows you have made. But I tell you, do not swear an oath at all, either by, wait, wait, what about hell and divorce? You're going too fast, for it is God's throne, or by the earth, for it is, okay, okay, whoa, 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 you're just going way too fast. Okay, I've lost two body parts. Half of me's gonna go to hell. I'm an adulterer because what? And then there's something about an oath. I can't be a Christian. <laughs> uh, welcome to the, what it would have been like to hear. It, there wasn't the pauses and stops, you know? And it's like, ah, what are you talking about? See, the Sermon on the Mount is scary for somebody who seeks to be a Christ follower. It's scary because there's so much in it. And it is the, you know, I love how he put it. If, this would be your life if you were perfectly following Christ. This is, well, that would be what it looks like. Um, you have heard it said, now I say to you. It's, it's just, you know, it's like, and I agree. It's like, now I say to you, time, don't do that anymore. I'm tired of that now I say to you part. Um, let, me, let me bring this home a little bit. And please don't raise your hand because I don't need to know. Your neighbor doesn't need to know. But you do need to know that God knows. So here's some questions. Is anyone not reconciled to a family member? called them Raka. And the word itself isn't, isn't the point. The Raka comes from an Aramaic word, Reka. And it was simply a derogatory expression that meant empty-headed, uh, insinuating somebody's stupidity or inferiority. It was an offensive name used to show utter contempt for that person. And Jesus warns that the use of such a word to describe someone was tantamount to murder and deserving of the severest punishment of the law. Still loving the Sermon on the Mount. How about looking at someone with lust in your heart? I'm noticing we're pretty intact with our eyeballs and our, and our hands. So I'm guessing we aren't following this teaching too closely. And if anybody, young folk, bear with me. Don't go out and go gouging body, cutting body parts off. I know that's not what he's saying here. But it doesn't diminish the message of the passage, though, because nothing is worth going to hell over. Not even a body part. Nothing is worth going to hell over. And there's more. Jesus telling us that being married to someone, divorced, makes us an adulterer. Then he talks about not making an oath. Vows and oaths are often a part of our lives. I swear by, uh, I'll do this, you know. I swear by my mother's grave, right? Um, but let me say this. R.C. Sproul wrote something about uh, making an oath. And, and it's the early Jesus' time. There was a common first century Jewish practice that was put in place to keep people from breaking uh, the law's rules regarding our promises, and that's out of numbers, but that's not the important part. Jewish teachers and leaders invented a system by which they could determine whether a vow had to be kept. Many rabbis did not consider it a sin to break a vow if it was not made explicitly in the name of God. In other words, they were creating their own loophole. Oaths made in the name of heaven or even the gold of the temple were not regarded as ultimately binding. Oaths that were made to, with God in them, they were. Anything else they want. So that led to people making oaths by persons or objects other than God. That is, where, you know, that's kind of, well, I swear by my mama's grave. You know, on my mama's grave, I'm not going to do that. But just was there to give them an out. And Jesus' response was, <laughs> let your yes be yes and your no be no. Mean what you say. Say what you mean. An eye for an eye. This one we like because it brings a semblance of justice, even though it just really means that two people go blind. And Jesus turns it into another instance of going further than what was required. In that era, in the Roman world, one could be compelled to carry a Roman soldier's backpack 
or their load one mile. But that was it. Jesus says two things. First, he says, don't dispute that you're, the com you're compelled to do this. And <laughs> secondly, he says, go another mile. And this theme is carried on as he calls upon us to love our enemies. How ridiculous is that? Love those who hate you. Pray for those who persecute you. Praying is probably the easy part. Love my enemy. I tell you, love your enemies, pray for those who persecute you, that you may be children of your Father in heaven. He causes his Son to rise on the evil and the good and sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. If you love those who love you, what reward will you get? Are not even the tax collectors doing that? And if you greet only your own people, what are you doing more than others? Do not even pagans do that. Be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly Father is perfect. And we can get lost in that word, perfect. The word is teleos, which means to be complete, to be mature, to be brought to its end, and to be perfect as well, as, uh, you know, to, to not make mistakes ever. But to be complete and mature is more what the what Jesus is talking about in this, in, in, in this passage is what I believe. Because none of us can be perfect. We're moving on to perfection. We do our best. We get better at what we do. We get more and more mature. And Andy Stanley has, <laughs> okay, okay, whoa, 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 you're just going way too fast. I've lost two body parts. Half of me's going to hell. I'm an adulterer because of what? And then there's something about an oath. I can't be a Christian. I can't. I can't be a Christian. That's hard. I thought that my yoke was easy. Why is this so hard? You know what, though? Andy Stanley's right. It's truth. If it were solely up to you and I, there would be no way to live this life that Jesus is describing to us. And yet, this is, the Christ, this is Christ's instruction to us. So what's going on, right? If I can't do it, why would Christ set me up to fail? So there's a couple of things that I want us to look at this morning. First, Jesus is very, very concerned about how we live. He, it matters. It matters to him how we live. It should matter to us how we live. He wants us to strive to live in a way that's different from the life that they were hearing from the Pharisees. The Pharisees looked like they had it all together, but Jesus points out that they don't. They may look good on the outside, but they're not internally following God. And too often we hear the message of love and grace and drop justice and holiness out of the picture. And for some, the justice and holiness is grabbed onto and love and grace are dropped out of the picture. Love, grace, mercy, a very real part of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. Because <laughs> I need love, grace, and mercy. But just, don't just hear that message and miss the teachings of Christ. Stop living for yourself. Stop living like the world wants you. Start living into your eternity, because that's what you said. When, when you answered yes to Christ, you stepped right into the kingdom. You're now living in the kingdom. The kingdom goes on. Your kingdom come, your will be done. Where? On earth, as it is in heaven. And when we say yes to Jesus, our lifestyle should reflect a kingdom lifestyle. There should be changes that come from that that are noticeable. Very concerned with how we live. Hoping we would live into the eternity the moment we say yes. And second, we need Jesus. <laughs> we need Jesus. We can't live the life he's challenging us to live without learning to rely on him. Paul reminds us in Romans that none are righteous. No, not one. He points us to the remedy for our inability to live this way. But now apart from the law, the righteousness of God had been made known to which the law and the prophets testify, having been fulfilled. This righteousness is given through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. There is no difference now between a Jew and a Gentile, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, and all are justified freely by His grace through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus. Our righteousness comes from Christ. 
It's not licensed to live in whatever manner we want or to ignore God's direction, but we need His strength, His power, His holiness, His grace, His love in order to live into the fulfillment of what we're called to. And that's where freedom lies, by the way. When we let Christ be the focus. We're grateful to Christ. He's fulfilled the requirements of the law. We don't have to fulfill the requirements of the law. He has done that. And to seek a life that goes beyond just the rules and the regulations. That's just a lot of the Sermon on the Mount is, is about going beyond what is expected into places that people just didn't want to go. We love God, love our neighbor. We extend that love to everybody we come in contact with. See, we're expected to model a new righteousness. And this righteousness is ours through Christ. It's his righteousness that we get to claim. It's not ours. It's a funny word. It's imputed. And I know that's a, that's a what? But what it means is that it's, it's not ours ever. It's not imparted to us. It's imputed. It's still Christ, but we get to live, claim that righteousness. It's his righteousness there is none righteous no not one that's that, yes that's true but i am with jesus and it's his righteousness that i claim it's new the new righteousness and we seek to live this way in all of our lives but please please don't let the enemy condemn you when you fail you know conviction is important it's it's in, to get us back on track, you know. If I'm getting off track and I do something wrong, I, I'll feel that twinge in my spirit that says, Mike, you, that's not where you ought to be going. That's conviction. That's you, you did something that you ought not to do. Bring it back. Condemnation is that is not that you did something. It's that you are a mess, you, that you are a mistake, that, that you're, it's, it's, there's no point for you. Romans 8.1 Therefore, there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. How much condemnation? None. There is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. However, there is conviction. You know? Guilt and shame is the way that I like to frame these. I'm a counselor for a lot of years. Guilt and shame. Guilt is I made a mistake. Shame is I am a mistake. Conviction is I made a mistake. Condemnation is I am a mistake. You're not a mistake. You make mistakes. The enemy wants to drive you into the ground with this. Don't let him. Don't let him. Conviction's important. Condemnation is never from God. So, Pastor, I'm not ready yet. After hearing how high the bar is, I have some work to do. Let me work on some stuff. Let me get better and learn more and figure it out. Then I'll... Step in. So I wanted to close with a brief story this morning. A young man who had heard the gospel accepted Christ. And a little while after that, a Christian teacher asked him, What have you done for Christ since you believed? And he replied, Oh, I'm a learner. Well, when you light a candle, do you light it to make the candle more comfortable or, to give it, or for it to give light? To give light. Do you expect it to give light after it's half burned or when you first light it? When you first light it. Very well. Go thou and do likewise. Begin at once. It's okay to make mistakes. You know, a lot of how we learn is, is a lot of mistakes get made, but then we, that helps us in our journey. You see, now is the time. Now is the time. This day is the time. Share your faith. Tell your story. Your story is important. It's important for the body of Christ, for each of us together to tell our stories reaches more people than any one of us. Tell your story. Talk, talk about your church to others. You know, we're doing Operation Christmas Child. Every month we have a mission project that we do. And last, last, last time we went up to... Manor Lakes and gave them all gift baskets. And we do all of these things that, that are to, to bring Christ into the community. We open up on a Saturday morning so that folks can use our restroom and drink our coffee and, and at the farmer's market. Why? Because we love our community and we're a part of it. We want people to know that Jesus loves them. And to all of those of you who have gotten up early on a Saturday and come in and help, thank you. Because that's what we do, right? 
get out of ourselves. Nobody wants to get up early, early on a Saturday, or if they, some of y'all might. Something wrong with you. <laughs> you don't have to have it all together. We're on a journey together. It's the journey of our lives. And the time has come to let God use you. Let God use you. It would be an amazing, amazing thing as you get to tell the story of how God used you this week. Michael?